cute. You go ahead and do that. Tap, yeah. Tap with yeah. your little. She specifically composing. said, quote, how do you imagine both wife and husband as composers? Do you have any idea how ridiculous and subsequently how much such an idiosyncratic rivalry must end up dragging us both down? How will it be if you happen to be just in the mood and but have to look after the house for me or get me something I happen to need uh. if you are to look after the trivialities of life for me? Does this mean for you breaking off your own life? Do you think that you will have to do without a high point of being which you cannot live without if you entirely give up your music in order to possess and also be my own? Uh, <laughs> yeah. Did she agree to that? Apparently she did. That's weird. Yeah, so it's kind of like she's been championed by feminists through you know history. I don't know why. The On the initial surface it was oh gosh she she was a woman and she had to get married and she was forced to marry this egomaniac and i mean she found this out before they got married and it yeah. wasn't like he was the only one right. out there and she right. still chose him over yeah. her music so yeah and obviously and you said that she was beautiful you know and she's talented she was raised well so she's well connected right so she had she must have had choices yep they were married in March of 1902. She was already pregnant. Mm. So that might have had a little to do with the final decision. And he turned out to be very demanding. Not that that should have been any surprise right. to her. Yeah. He, you know, he. You don't get a 20 page letter from someone and you're like, you're demanding what? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so apparently she was to fetch him every day from the opera and walk to him no matter what, if it was. Five feet of snow, she was supposed to walk to him. If she was pregnant, she was supposed to walk to him and meet him and walk Mm -hmm. back with him. And so, yeah, as you might imagine, she quickly fell into a depression because having children and keeping house was not what suited her temperament. They did have a second daughter in 1904, and without a creative outlet, she started casting her eyes for other amusements. By 1907, their firstborn child, Maria, died of either scarlet fever or diphtheria. Oh, no. And she was so depressed in the wake of that that she eventually went to a health spa in 1910. What is that? A health spa typically was a fancy psychiatric facility. Okay. Sort of like Canyon Ranch. Except in the early 20th century, they probably did yoga and breathed lots of fresh air. With sheep and Yeah, goats. exactly. So while at this health spa, Alma was introduced to, quote, a remarkably handsome German named Walter, Walter Gropius, Gropius, who was also staying at this health spa. I'm not sure spa. if he was handsome. Yeah. Uh, yeah, not, I'm not too sure about that either. <laughs> not, none of these men were particularly handsome, like, if you ask me. But. No, you're, very, you're that's correct. So Gropius was 27, recovering from the arduous task of establishing his own architectural firm. Yeah, he was really stressed out. So yep. there you go. She and Walter immediately sparked. Uh, she recounted in her memoirs, quote, We danced, gliding slowly across the room with the youth. I heard that he was an architect and had studied with one of my father's well-known friends. We stopped dancing and talked. That sounds like a really momentous mm-hmm. meeting, right? Mm-hmm. Though allegedly they became impassioned within hours, but it did seem to be more. There was a mental, sure. mental spark there as well. Yeah. She wrote in a letter to him soon after they met, I love in you your intellect, your artistry, which I knew before I had seen a stroke of your drawing. So you're right in that she saw, you know, something in him. Right. And he was actually getting ready to design the Vegas shoe last factory. Yeah. So this was going on with that. And he wrote to her, I would like to build a large factory entirely of white concrete, all blank walls with large holes in them, large plate glass planes, and a black roof. Yeah. A great, pure, richly structured shape, undisturbed by small color variations, painterly values, and architectural curly cues. Interestingly, I'm convinced that work is the only true deity of our time, and in art we must find help find an expression for it. Mm-hmm. To which she responded, the, the more, more you, you accomplish... accomplish the, the more, more you will, will be, be mine. mine. <laughs> oh, boy. 
they carried on this relationship even after they both left the health spa. Right. Unfortunately, at some point, Gropius misaddressed a letter or something. I don't know when they say misaddressed, like if he referred to her by a pet name or called her my darling. And Mahler did find out about it. Mahler sought the advice of Sigmund Freud. Really? Yes. And which Freud told him that he should quit repressing Alma and give her more support in terms of her musical abilities. He did, for a time, support her. He helped edit her music, and then he promoted it. She claims that she wrote hundreds of compositions. There's only 12 remaining left. Yeah. Or 14 left. Did she destroy him, though? Yes, possibly she did. Yeah. So the 14 are what I think Mahler edited and promoted for her. And now for something not so scandalous. Stay tuned for more scandal sheets after the break. And now, back to the show. Unfortunately, Mahler died the next year in late 1911. On Gropius's 28th birthday. birthday. That's correct. Uh, He had a heart defect, and apparently it was complications from that. I imagine it was probably something like irregular heartbeat or something. And no one his wife was getting it on with this young architect dude. Yeah, that Mm -hmm. could help. That probably helped him along a little bit. Mm Mm-hmm. So you would think that she and Gropius would happily skip off into the sunset. No. Well, no. She apparently held out a little bit of resentment for him accidentally revealing their affair to her former husband. Uh-huh. He was riddled with guilt because they were having an affair. So by 1912, it, things had kind of begun to fizzle out. Sure. She took up with... An artist, an expressionist oh, artist right. named Oscar Kokolska. Uh-huh. She met him at a salon hosted by her mother and stepfather, much like the other men that she met in the past. Once again, there was an instant connection, and the two fell into a passionate affair in April of 1912. Later in her life, Alma acknowledged that Oscar was the only man that she ever truly loved. Oh. I think it is... Is that true? Ugh. I don't know. They were together for three years, so compared to some of her... She was with her last husband for 16, though. Yeah, and I, yeah, yeah. I'm not quite sure why from what I've read about it, right. but we'll I get mean, there. I mean, sometimes you remember people, I guess, even if Better. they were short-lived. Right. I, I think they probably were the type of couple that were so well-matched, they got on each other's nerves. He was incredibly possessive mm. or e- e- egocentric. egocentric. yeah. As was she, uh, they were both very dramatic, and he particularly was very moody and prone to outburst. By July of 1912, she was pregnant with his child and decided to terminate the pregnancy. Mm. He apparently took a blood-stained cloth from her in the aftermath. Mm-mm. And carried it around for years, no. stating, "This is my only child, and will always be so." Ooh, gross. Just a bit, yeah. <laughs> and I'm what I'm like. He's a little deranged. Yeah, he 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 was a little south of of sane, I think. Hmm. They because I should say they were together for three years, and I should also note that during this time she continued. To correspond with Gropius and failed. Well, he would have been in the war, right? Not yet. Oh, war really? Just, England declared war in, on Germany in August of 1914. Oh, and this is not. This, this is, is not like yet. right around okay. yeah, 1914, okay. 1915. So um, they had continued to correspond, and mm-hmm. she had never mentioned to him that she was shacked up with this artist. <laughs> Oh, she didn't tell him no. about her home life. Yeah. Yeah. So that was that was very kind well, of her. I guess it didn't affect the future. No, because in <laughs> 1915, they reunited. But as uh, Adrian just mentioned, Gropius was by then a mil- in the military because the war, mm-hmm. World War I, had started. Despite that, she wanted to marry right away. And so they eloped in Berlin. Yeah. And she wrote in her diary that at the time, quote, my desire is pure and clear. I have no other wish but to make this talented man happy. 
for a few months. <laughs> so know. did he not write a 20 page prenup? He did not. Okay. He was serving in the war, but he was still around sometimes huh. because he was on, he had been placed on the short list to yeah. be the director of. Cause he wasn't always gone. It sounded like he was, yeah. Cr- it was almost worse because they were, he was like back and forth as opposed to just being away. Right. And yeah. that seemed to irritate her yeah. even more. <laughs> but he was, so he got involved with this or was on the short list for the Grand Ducal School of the Arts and Crafts in Weimar. And she encouraged him to meet with the Grand Duke of Saxe Weimar to discuss the job. She actually told him, This position is not so grand. You should enter into it only if they give you all the authority you ask for in writing. Wow. Yeah. So a contract. So make them, Right. Yeah. So I guess she was That's not pretty, bad advice. No, she was pretty clever about that. And, and, uh, and he did get hired at that on the requested terms. Yeah. But of course the war interfered with things. So right. it was closed and used as a military hospital uh, while the war was going on. And he, I guess, went off to the war, was gone off and on, not off enough to where she did not mm-hmm. get pregnant right. and uh, gave birth to their daughter, Manon. That's French. weird, neither of them were French. No, no, not at all. And by early 1918, Mahler had begun a relationship with the man who would become her third husband, Franz Verfel. Mm-hmm. But before we get to that, Adrian's going to tell you more about what Gropius was doing during their short-lived marriage. <laughs> so Gropius interests me the most and is the most significant in, I guess, a historical, architectural history timeline. But as Caroline mentioned, they met in 1910. Gropius did not get an academic degree so he worked in the office of an architect called Peter Behrens, who <clears throat> that his studio in Berlin also played home to famous or men who would become famous architects like Mies, Ludwig Mies van der Rohe and Le Corbusier. So Corbu and Gropius had kind of a, I mean, it wasn't a rivalry, like they were, they were contemporaries of each other. But it, it was a it was a rivalry of sorts. They believed in the same things, but I don't think they were fighting with each other. They they both respected each other. So Alma and Gropius, as Caroline also mentioned, that the war was keeping them from each other. And and interestingly, they grew up in different ways. So Alma had, as we know, a, a fairly upper middle class upbringing. So she has beautiful, fine things. She's in Vienna. She has beautiful decorative arts and these paintings and, you know, nothing is, this is all before the turn of the century. So, you know, everything is very detailed and gilded and there's a lot of craftsmanship going into everything that she has. And as we know, modernism is sort of um, a reaction against that. As we know, Mies says less is more. So you don't have uh, sort of the detail and the the things that, that Alma was growing up around. There's an interesting contradiction there that Alma was growing up among fine and decorative arts, but Gropius was advocating for his Bauhaus, well, which I'll talk about in a minute. The Bauhaus workshop became the new progressive idea in architecture and, and arts. There was no distinction between artists and craftsmen. So it wasn't sort of an elitist only people that can afford art or furniture or architecture buy it. Like, it's sort of art for everyone. Right. I, I read a, an article called The Untold Story of Alma Mahler and Her Relationship to the Bauhaus. And, and the author says, in other words, Mahler, Alma Mahler, was a gilded oil painting and Gropius was a sleek chair fashioned from metal tubes and leather. Yeah, I read that one too. And it's totally true. It is. And it's great. Arch Daily, which is a really, really great website, went into detail about the Fagus Shoe Last Factory, which was Walter Gropius's first major project and one of the earliest built works of the modern movement. I think it was completed in 1913. So it's very streamlined. And it's 
I mean, I think it's sexy. It sort of sits there. These it's horizontal. There's no balconies. It's very sleek outside. There's huge. Ex- 